the focus of my research here at UAMS is on Staphylococcus aureus. Um, uh, most people, they may not realize it, but most people are aware of Staph aureus. It's all over the popular press in the form of MRSA or MRSA. When um, MRSA stands for methicillin resistant Staph aureus. And it's gotten a lot of press because these are uh, strains of, of Staph aureus that are resistant to the preferred antibiotics and that makes it very hard, much harder to effectively treat uh, the infections. Uh, but another thing that people don't realize is that while Staph aureus can cause really devastating, even life-threatening infection, uh, it, it, it peacefully exists on most of us, or many of us, uh, either on our skin or, or in our nose, without causing any harm. Now the trouble is that, you know, life is sort of a dynamic process. Things change over time, things change uh, you know, maybe later today you get a small cut or abrasion and this staph that lives on your skin could find its way into the bloodstream. And even then, most of the time, if you're healthy, you'll be able to fight that off, but sometimes not. Uh, and and that's, when, that's when you get, uh, th that's when it becomes a problem with infection. Now, one of the things that changes that, that my laboratory is particularly interested in involves the use of implants, biomedical implants or indwelling medical devices and and these are commonly used. Everything from catheters, if you've ever been in the hospital or know someone in the hospital, they probably had an IV line. And what that means is that there was a breach in the skin directly into the bloodstream. And Staph aureus, of course, can take advantage of that and get into the bloodstream. Now one of the things that, that we're particularly interested in are orthopedic implants. Here's a an example of, uh, in one case, a hip replacement or implants used for fracture repair. It's really amazing what an orthopedic surgeon can do uh, to rebuild a battered body. Uh, as an example, my son was in an accident in 2001. It was a bad car accident. Um, and it, to put him back together required 13 implants. Now today, you'd never know that he was in that accident. It's again a remarkable job. But that can be completely reversed by infection because when you put these implants in, that again is another one of those things, one of those opportunities that sometimes Staph aureus can, uh, can sort of promote the transition from a harmless inhabitant of your skin to an infectious agent causing a really serious infection. And these infections are particularly bad because um, there's this whole process involved where, you know, when you put the implant in, the implant gets uh, uh, almost immediately coated with your own proteins. So now let's say that Staph aureus happens to get into your bloodstream. Uh, it's, it comes along, encounters that coated implant, and it has the ability to stick to it. Not only can it stick to it, but it, it can also stick to itself. So over time, the bacteria accumulate on the implant, and they kind of encase themselves uh, in, a, in a matrix of various sorts. So you, you think of it as a protective matrix where they're attached to the implant, and what that does is protect them, the bacteria within inside that matrix, from both antibiotics and host defenses. The term for that is a biofilm. So you attach to it, you accumulate, you form this matrix, and that's called a biofilm. And the, it's protective enough that what has to happen in many cases is you, you can't treat it without surgically removing the implant. Uh, that, that's the primary focus of research in my lab. Those kinds of Staph aureus infections, can we develop better ways to deal with these infections so that implant doesn't have to be removed. So in thinking about how best to do that, I, I, I sort of liken the, the biofilm to a fort. So you're, the bacteria sitting in the biofilm on the implant are in effect sitting in their own self-made fort, uh, protecting themselves from your defense systems and from antibiotics that your physician may prescribe. So how, how can we overcome that? Well, it seems to me there are three ways, and we're pursuing all three of these actively in the lab. One is develop better methods to detect the fort being built before it gets built. So this is entirely analogous um, to, say, cancer therapy. If 
you know, the reason that you need to, to have regular checkups and colonoscopies and mammograms is because the earlier you detect cancer, the earlier in the process you detect tumor formation, the better likelihood you have of curing it. And this is completely analogous to that. The earlier we can detect the presence of the bacteria and them attempting to form a biofilm, the better our chances are of being able to prevent that from happening and the better our chances are of being able to treat it. A second method uh, is that, you know, if, if you think about building a fort or building anything else, you, that takes tools. And from a bacteriology point of view, what we try to do is understand what those tools are. What tools does Staph aureus use to build its biofilm? So in this, in this image here, uh, we use a, a, an assay system in the lab to measure the ability to build that biofilm or build that fort. So if you see a dark dot, that just means that the fort was successfully built. Where it's clear, it means that we've identified something that the bacteria needs to build the fort. And what we're trying to do is identify the most important tools, the tools that Staph aureus has to have to build the fort. And if we can find those, then we can develop ways to, uh, to target those therapeutically so that we can prevent that process from happening. Now, the, the third approach that we're exploring is, uh, so, so let's assume that uh, we, we, we were unable to detect the fort before it was built, or we, we've been unable to find the, the, the one tool that's required. What, what else could we do? So the other avenue we're exploring is, is nanotechnology. Now, what a nanoparticle is, is simply a very, very small uh, particle. It could be made of gold, it can be made of various materials. It's much, much smaller even than a bacterial cell. There are ways you can, you can make a nanoparticle and if you sort of energize it with a laser, that nanoparticle in a very, very small area will heat up uh, to high temperature and, and that can kill whatever is attached to that nanoparticle. So the way we're trying to use that nanotechnology is to find ways to, to, to deliver the nanoparticle very sel selectively to Staph aureus inside the fort. You can sort of view it as, um, you know, finding a way to, to breach the fort or put a bomb at the, at the, uh, at the door of the fort so you can, you can energize that nanoparticle and use that energy to, to get inside the fort and then once inside the fort very selectively kill the bacteria within it without collateral damage, without damaging the things around the fort, the host tissue, without damaging you you can very selectively, uh, given the very small size of these nanoparticles, kill the bacteria inside the fort. So that's our third approach. All of these things collectively are aimed at uh, developing methods that can be used to treat uh, infections caused by Staph aureus, particularly these really, really difficult to treat infections that are associated with biofilms, even irrespective of whether or not they're caused by MRSA. So any staph strain, we can either uh, prevent uh, the infection from occurring in the first place or develop better ways to treat it so that the implant won't have to be removed.